Sometimes when we approach the readings for the liturgy, it's not altogether clear how they're related, and, but other times it, it's very clear, and I would say today is a time where it's very clear because all three readings and even the um, responsorial psalm uh, are all about the relationship of the Jews and the Gentiles, and it's particularly about the calling of the Gentiles to faith uh, in Jesus Christ and how that comes about through the choice of the Jewish people as uh, the first chosen people and the vehicle by which Christ would come into the world. So in the first reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, we hear about how there will be foreigners who will join themselves to the Lord, ministering to him, loving the name of the Lord and becoming his servants. The word there that's uh, in the Hebrew that's translated as ministering is actually a priestly wor word. It's a word that would be um, used of priests ministering to God in the temple. And uh, as we know, the, the uh, Gentiles were only permitted to marginally participate in the Jewish uh, liturgy. They had the so-called so court of the Gentiles, the outer court of the temple into which everybody was permitted to go, including uh, the Gentiles, and there they could observe some of the things going on in the temple, but they weren't allowed to offer sacrifice. There was a, there's a letter from the sect of Jews called the Essenes, who were very, very strict, uh, that was directed to the priests of the temple, complaining about the fact that they were allowing uh, the Gentiles to offer sacrifice. Um, and they even were scandalized by the fact that grain that had been grown by, by the Gentiles was being used as a sacrifice in the temple. So there was this restriction uh, of the Gentiles and their participation in the liturgy. But in Isaiah's prophesy, prophecy, looking forward to a different time, he's talking about how the Gentiles themselves will be ministering to the Lord and they will become his servants and they will keep the Sabbath free from profanation. When our Lord drove uh, the, the, the money changers out of the temple, more than likely he drove them out of the court of the Gentiles um, because this was the only way that they could participate in, in, the, uh, in the, um, uh, the Jewish liturgy. So it's not evident in the, in the reading about the, the cleansing of the temple, but it seems as though our Lord was actually concerned about the faith of the Gentiles. It was their faith. That it was not only a profanation of the temple and, a, and disrespect to God, but it was also damaging, you might say, to the faith of the Gentiles who had this one place where they could worship the true God. And so um, Isaiah goes on to say, I'll bring them to my holy mountain and make joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my, off on, on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The temple really wasn't a house of prayer for all peoples. So this uh, prophecy of Isaiah was, was remarkable and it may have been, con uh, uh, been considered scandalous by, by many of the Jewish people. But this was God's intention from the beginning, which brings us to reflect for a moment on why God chose the Jews in the first place and why he chose specifically um, to bring the Messiah from the Jews. And one of the usual answers is that um, is that our Lord needed to separate one people from the Gentiles of the ancient world who are all practicing paganism of various sorts. Sometimes it was relatively innocent. You know, they were just seeking God the best way they knew how without divine revelation. And sometimes, as in the case of uh, Carthage and um, uh, the, the worship of Moloch, it, in, it involved human sacrifice. And so God wanted to take them away from the idolatry and from these 
absolutely reprehensible practices and establish one people, a small nation, which would learn how to worship the one true God. And you might say, well, why, why was that really necessary? Well, if you read the Bible, you see how necessary it was because the Jews themselves, after they received the revelation and, and the Mosaic law and all the help and providence of God and the miracles, continually fell back into, uh, in, into uh, idolatry uh, because they were surrounded by pagans and there was always this temptation to go back to what appeared to be to them an easier way, a way of integrating with everybody else. So this is the, this is the usual reason, it's a good reason for the choice of the Jews as God's people and, and the vehicle again by which the Messiah would be taken, but it was always God's intention to bring everyone into the house of God, but he had to do it by steps uh, in, through a history that was providentially guided by his own hand. We move on then to the uh, letter to Saint, of St. Paul to the Romans, where he's talking uh, directly to the Gentiles. Uh, and uh, I he says, I glory in my ministry in order to make my race jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? There's a part missing from, from this uh, 11th chapter uh, and the verses that we're reading today, there's some, some parts excerpted out, and one part is where St. Paul is talking about the olive tree and how some branches have been broken off, and these would be uh, most likely the unbelieving Jews, and that the Gentiles are being grafted onto the tree. So they're not the natural born children of God, but they have been, by God's providence, uh, grafted into the tree, and in, in a certain way, replace the branches that have been broken off. But this too, this rejection of Christ uh, by most of the Jews, not willed by God, is again providentially taken up into God's plan and used not only for the influx of the Gentiles into the church, but the ultimate restoration of the Jewish nation to, to, uh, to the, the full fullness of what it means to be the people of God and, and, at, and at the end, beyond the reading that we have today, this is what uh, St. Paul talks about is that the ultimate salvation of the Jews uh, through, through Christ. And so again, we see that how Jesus chooses all of us to be, his, uh, to be the children of his Father and, uh, and God's plan in spite of our weakness, in spite of infidelity, idolatry, uh, refusal to obey, refusal to have faith, whether it's of the Gentiles or Jews, is all taken up into God's plan and used ultimately for, uh, for our salvation. And then we come to the, the, uh, the Holy Gospel according to Matthew and this wonderful passage about the Canaanite woman who uh, has a daughter that is tormented by a demon. She is uh, from the area around uh, Israel, which is uh, uh, Gentile, Tyre and Sidon and, and that Chorazin and places like that are not, not part of the Jewish nation and these areas were avoided by the Jews, the people were considered uh, unclean and all the rest, and so uh, not part of those who belonged to the covenant and to the promises of God. But she uh, has faith in the Lord and knows that he can cure her daughter, can deliver her daughter. And so she calls out at a distance, have pity on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. And the disciples find her annoying. You know, they have this, you know, this attitude towards her because she is a Gentile. She's bothersome and not really worthy of, of, of their attention. And so they ask the Lord if, he wants them to shoo her away. Uh, but our Lord instead uh, engages her directly, but not in a particularly gentle way. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the woman came and did Jesus homage saying, Lord, help me. He said in reply, it is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. She said, please Lord, for even the dogs eat the scraps that fall 
from the table of their masters. This is a really wonderful exchange, be, uh, dialogue between Jesus and, and a soul who is seeking uh, his help because, again, she is a Gentile uh, and he has come truly first for the house of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but the woman still has faith and, uh, and persists at asking the Lord to, to help him. And, and beyond that, he still resists, and he resists in a way that is um, severe, and there's no way of uh, explaining this away. I've heard this explained away by uh, people saying that the, the word that the, the, the Lord actually uses in, in, the, in the Greek, uh, recorded in the Greek, uh, could, actually, could also mean puppies. You know, and it, maybe it does, but that doesn't deflate what our Lord says because the comparison then is with the children of the household and the, and the, and the little puppies who the children will find cute, you know? So if you think about that, if we spoke that way in today's context, we would all, all understand that as very bigoted, you know, very, very uh, horrible way of looking at a particular uh, uh, out a particular race. Of course, our Lord is, is, is simply taking up the prejudice of his people and repeating it out, out loud uh, to test her. And I think we have to conclude in, the, in this case that our Lord is doing this with this particular woman because he knows what she needs, she knows what she's capable of, and he also knows how deep is her faith. So it would seem that there's a, you know, that she takes it perhaps even tongue in cheek, you know, that the Lord is provoking a response from her and, and she's willing to play along. And she does, she has tremendous faith. It's not, uh, you know, please Lord, even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of their masters. And then our Lord concedes, oh woman, great is your faith, let it be done as you wish. Right, and so she, her faith is tested. She passes the test. God rewards her. Jesus rewards her uh, with um, uh, the healing of her daughter, and she is brought in to the faith of of the people uh, of God, which will be preached to them by the apostles after our Lord's ascension. So I think the lesson that we can learn from today's readings is that um, there is this providence of God that uh, runs through, through all history, runs throughout the history of our, of our uh, human race, and through our personal history. It's governed by the Lord, and um, the Lord gives us at each moment what we need, even if he doesn't treat each one of us the same. He knows our hearts and our minds. He knows our history. He knows what has happened to us in the past, what will happen to us in the future, what is happening to us now, he understands the, the circumstances and, and the causes of everything that goes on uh, infinitely better than we can possibly imagine. And, and we need to have that faith by which we can trust him even in the midst of sorrow and difficulty, contradiction and challenge. Perhaps we should think in this way. Perhaps we should think that some, sometimes when we see obstacles as very discouraging and uh, disappointing, and, uh, uh, fill, and, and these circumstances fill us with dread and anxiety, we should in our faith, in our, in our meditations on the life and death and resurrection of the Lord, try to reorient ourselves so that we see these challenges as opportunities. Opportunities because they are full of God's grace, that the Lord is present uh, even and most particularly in the difficulties because they represent for us our participation in the Lord's cross in his suffering, death, and resurrection. May we have the faith of uh, the, the woman, the Canaanite woman from uh, Tyre and Sidon. May we have the faith of those who are truly to be called the people of God.